Welcome to this free preview of our premium members-only content to help you get a better idea of what you'll be getting as a Xenolog Insider member. The full version of this audio program is available for members to listen to online or as a downloadable MP3 file for you to listen to on the go. Membership is very affordable and can help you turn your photography business into something you can really be proud of. So, without further ado, let's jump into the preview. Hi everybody, this is Nigel Merrick, the founder of the Xenolog Photography Business and Marketing blog, and today I'm excited to talk with Gillian Todd from Gillian Todd Portrait Couture. Gillian is a boudoir photographer based in the San Francisco Bay Area, but she has a very interesting and unique approach to her photography that we're going to talk about today. So I'm very excited to have Gillian with me today for a chat about her business, her philosophy, and how she approaches this exciting niche of photography. So welcome, Gillian. It's really great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. So before we get started, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the photography business and kind of the, some of the things that may have led you to where you're at right now? Sure. Um, I grew up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and in high school, um, I took my first photography class. Um, we made a little pinhole camera with the oatmeal tub and the black spray paint, and um, the piece of photo paper went outside, sat there for 20 minutes, and I thought, I don't know what the hell I'm doing or what this is going to turn <laughs> into. And when I put the paper into the developer and I saw it come up for the first time, that was it for me. It was like being grabbed by the throat and you are going to, this is going to take over your life. And it really did for a long time. It was an obsession. I wanted to go to school for photography. It was sort of frowned upon my family. I come from a long line of public service and um, it was not seen as something that would be sustainable. You know, the pension and the theme in my family, it's all law enforcement. It's recidivism is job security. So, you know, go into law enforcement, take a, you know, take a, a niche there. And it was not something that I was really that interested in. I don't think I would ever pass an academy. So I sort of ate around the craving. I did go to college. Um, I got a sociology degree with a minor in photography, took every photography class that I could. And then I was an esthetician. So skincare, makeup, waxing, and all the time that I was doing that, I was still photographing everything and anything anybody would ask me to do. And I was perfectly happy doing that. About, I'd say, four years ago, I finally, I was sitting down and just looking at, okay, I'm this old and I'm looking at the rest of my life with my kids and am I living my passion? And said, I'm not really a great example of that. I'm telling them that they can do anything they want and they set their mind to, and I'm not. So finally, I just made it my business and it did run concurrent to a full-time job so that I could support myself and be able to support my family and be able to launch it in a way that was responsible. So um, that's sort of how it evolved over, over the years. Right. And, you know, that's a funny story when you talk about building that camera out of an oatmeal box and mm -hmm. some paper. And it reminded me of... The first time that I ever really got into photography when I was a a kid, and, and my dad gave me uh, a Kodak brownie at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, and we put some, you know, we put some film in it, and we were in Wales uh, on holiday, and I remember snapping away, and then th this awful feeling when I went to advance the film to the next frame and it wouldn't it was stuck you know and it wouldn't it was like what what happened it was like oh you reached the end so i without even thinking at the time i i think i was only maybe 7 or 8 years old you know and i so i ripped the back of the camera open and i pulled this film out and i just pulled all of the film out in one great big strip and was crying like crazy because i couldn't see anything well where are my photos i think i was i was sort of like wanting the digital age back you know when i was yes seven or eight, you know, back in the 1960s, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> where are they? Why don't where? I have an LCD to see what I just shot? Uh, exactly. <laughs> My dad was very patient, you know, and he explained to me, no, we need to take the film to the, uh, to the developer, you know, and have them process it. I, and I was so upset, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, you know, it, it, when you see that photograph, 
for the first time that something you've you've created and taken it it really does uh grab your soul and and kind of pull you into it and i and i took that camera with me everywhere i went and we used to take family vacations to spain and italy and stuff and i i remember i have photographs from pompeii and from vesuvius and from oh. sorrento and uh, all, all these places of course they were all in black and white you know from back then but and uh, and i wish i had still had a lot of those photographs i think a lot of them have, have since uh, disappeared but yeah it, it it's funny i hadn't really thought about that for a long time and there's there's a whole kind of story that goes with that camera but you know this is not about me this is about you so 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 you've you've been running your boudoir uh portrait couture business now by itself for about a year and a half is that right yeah what i did was um over the over the years like i mentioned i was shooting everything and anything and i was finding that you know that was nice but i don't really like to shoot kids when they're moving i like babies when they're sleeping and you know it's just easier mm -hmm. and they're more angelic that way um families you get into the family dynamics and sometimes it's hard with you know, 20 people to get everybody to really pay attention. And I'm not really, I get overwhelmed a little bit with a lot of different energy going on. I really like the one-on-one. -on -one. And based on my history in aesthetics, it was really about getting to that beauty. And women uh, specifically were really what I started to uh, resonate with the most. And that's something that took a long time to realize is that niching isn't a bad thing or niching. Everybody has a different, you know, take on that. But um, my feeling was these are the people that I'm going to attract because that's what I'm most interested in and that's the, the thing that I want to explore the most. It's an extension of aesthetics. I mean, I do the hair and the makeup and conversations inevitably go to, well, my skin is bothering me. How do I fix this? So it's really a girlfriend kind of day. So it was really about finding what I wanted to do the most and who I was going to attract in my business. Right. So I decided to let go of everything else. Mm -hmm. And so before that point, you you were involved in uh, all sorts of different niches. I, th and I know that mm -hmm. uh, you were doing some weddings and you had done some uh, children and babies and families and so on. But but at some point you decided that you really wanted to try to focus on the niche that was that you were most passionate about the one that really resonated with you the most and the one where you felt that you had more creative control if you like over what it was that you were that you were doing now you know i know that a lot of photographers are when they, especially when they're starting out they try to fo focus on doing lots of different things you know they get into all kinds of uh, genres and and because they can't maybe decide either where their passions lie or perhaps they don't have the confidence to uh, think that they can earn a, a living from just one is there anything else that you could add to what you just said to maybe help people make that decision to focus in on one uh, one genre or one niche Sure. Um, I think you really have to know yourself very well in terms of what do you love? Are you out there doing it because you love photography or you love something that you're serving others for? Some people are wonderful with brides and grooms, and they really have a way of serving them that I don't. And so if they can sit and go and think about what am I really passionate about, what do I love shooting, when I go out and I shoot – a wedding versus when I shoot a family, how does that make me feel? Does that make me feel like I'm doing something of great value? Does it make me feel like I'm unique in it? Does it make me, you know, when I wake up in the morning, do I, oh, I can't wait to shoot this wedding or I can't wait to edit this wedding. You really have to pay attention to what your, I mean, we, we go back to soul is telling you. Why are you in it? For me, with aesthetics, it was about healing. I really loved working on acne. I loved healing and changing women's perspective on themselves and their self-esteem. So that sort of carried over. It's just a theme. So when I started to see that come out, I'm changing the way somebody's seeing themselves, the way they inhabit their body. 
it made a difference, and it, it really felt a different way to me. It was something I couldn't wait to do. When's my next client? When, you know, I need to get another person in here because this just feeds my soul in a way. So when you get to that and you start to see a theme, then that's where you have to go. And niching is, is not a bad thing. People are going to be attracted to you because of your passion. It's going to show in your photographs. When there are quotes about, you know, these photographs are more about me than the subject, um, the film not only records my subject but me, when you start to feel that in your photography, you know you're on the right path, and that's where you have to go. You can't deny it. And, and you've, you've, you've brought something up that's, that's very interesting and certainly very close to my philosophy as a, as a coach in, in the way that I try to help other photographers, and that is the, you know, the helping them to understand what the primary driving force is for why they do what they do. Uh, and, and I talk about this a, a lot on my blog and in interviews and uh, in my coaching sessions with people. You know, for example, I will ask somebody, well, you know, if they're struggling in their business right now and, and they're finding it hard to attract new clients, for example, I might say to them, well, look, if somebody called you up on the phone today and they asked you outright, why should I hire you? Why? Why? What is it about you and your photography that makes you so better for me than the uh, photographer down the street or, or across the road? Uh, not, not necessarily that I'm asking what makes you a better photographer or that you create better photographs, but why are you better for me? Mm -hmm. Sadly, you know, uh, most people really can't answer that question. And it, it takes a lot of introspection and a lot of thought to get to the to the answer. Um, but what you've already mentioned so far is that you already have a great idea of what that is for you. You, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned that it's about healing. It's about changing the way that your clients see themselves. And you obviously have a very deep connection in that that comes from uh, something that perhaps was back in your childhood or as in your formative years or something, some, something that has affected you in a very deep way that drives you to want to do that for other people. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I didn't want to let that point kind of slip by um, without really uh, emphasizing it for people because I, I, I believe that it's, it's one of the, probably one of the most critical parts of any business. And and it's probably the one thing that's led you to fall into the niche that you're you're in, you know, and, and why it is that you don't resonate so well with family portraiture or baby photography. It's not that you're not good at it. It's just that it 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 doesn't. Ha it's not on the same frequency uh, that you operate on. If that's that makes exactly any sense. The, word. the frequency, the vibration. It's it's sort of this right brain. We're all we're all right brain anyway. But that woo-woo kind of, some people say, oh, well, it's metaphysical or whatever. Yes, it is. I mean, we, we have to follow that. I found that when I was outside of what I needed to be doing, when I was, I was continuing in corporate, what finally made me quit my job was I kept getting sick. I kept getting sick over and over and over again. And it was this, hello, wake up, you're not supposed to be doing this anymore. And finally I fell. I ended up with a concussion, a um, sprained ankle, um, I don't even remember, I'm a whiplash, it was terrible. It took about six weeks to recover from. The concussion was, you know, my memory, my um, verbal communication was not great. For a while I'd get spacey. And it was just finally I had to get out of there. The next thing would have been a, a car accident or whatever. So when you're not living in the vibration or the frequency that you're supposed to be in, there will be clues and you have to listen to them. People don't get sick over and over and over again for no reason. You've got to listen to those those clues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, and I know exactly what you're talking about there because I went through something very similar. I, I went through a very similar experience uh, when I was working in the corporate world. I, I spent about um, 20 plus years working as a computer programmer and a project manager and uh, working for software houses and banks and, and, and all that kind of thing. And while I was very good at it and I, and I 
and I enjoyed the work that I was doing. Um, as I got older, I found uh, there was this kind of increasing pressure, if you like, internally that was something was struggling to to get out, and there was a conflict between my uh, analytical side of, of my personality and and my creative side. And that conflict just grew and grew and grew and became more and more difficult as I got older. And I found that I was becoming less satisfied with my work uh, sitting behind a desk programming computers all day. I, I found that I was becoming uh, very stressed out by things. And eventually I, I had a, like a, almost like a, just a, everything just imploded. Uh, and uh, and I, you know, I found myself quite ill. Uh, with anxiety and, and all kinds of uh, stress-related issues, but but once I was able to kind of release that one side that was causing all of that uh, and move to a more creative kind of lifestyle, it, everything changed. Mm -hmm. It was it was okay. almost like it changed overnight. Yeah, it's, it's just very... flipping a switch exactly. Yeah. And uh, and so, you know, I you know I'm very thankful for that experience in one sense, although it was it was very it was very frightening for me at the time, um, because you know I, my livelihood was as a computer programmer, and you know to to kind of think of myself as becoming a photographer or a creative person, which you know as you mentioned at the beginning, you know isn't traditionally seen as a as a job that comes with security, oh, wow. uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was a big step, and uh, but I'm I'm very glad that I that I took it. So thank you so much for bringing that up and and sharing that with us, you know, because again, I think it's 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 important, and and I think people need to, uh, you know, accept who they are as a creative person. Uh, they need to figure out what it is that really drives their passion and then and then focus on it with laser intensity and 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 follow it you know and, and trust trust their instincts as it were now one of the things that i really liked on your website when i when i was looking on there was this um this beautiful uh, tagline that you have that says portrait couture is transformation from the outside in Mm -hmm. the opportunity for every woman to discover and celebrate her own beauty. And, you know, you, you've managed to encapsulate in just those few words what your business really means, not just for, for you, the artist, but it, what it means for the people that you serve. And, and I'm curious, you know, to find out how this idea evolved and, and, and how you came about this very, very cool representation of what you do and, and how has it shaped what your business is today? Well, when um, I started to sort of follow that bliss of working with women specifically, um, boudoir is, is something that has been evolving and has come back on the scene, obviously. It's, it's a very um, trendy thing right now in a way. And I was shooting traditional boudoir, the sort of piece shots in a way, the lingerie, the TNA in a way instead of being able to, I, I don't know another way to say that, but what I found was that was really focusing on this sexual side of women. And I wasn't very comfortable with that because I felt like it was almost self-objectification. And there's, that's not the thing that I wanted to serve. That wasn't the part of women that I wanted to serve. Um, so again, it's, it's finding, it's following those hunches and it's following that intuition what I found that made the most profound difference with women who were coming in was the beauty shots, the face, the decollete, um, their skin, their makeup. Um, they really felt wonderful having their makeup and hair done. And it seems kind of like a frivolous thing. You know, we go to the makeup counter and we have makeup and we buy makeup and it's that lipstick effect of, oh, we're high for a little bit, the endorphins, and makes us feel connected to each other when we all shop in groups. But um, that one-on-one -on -one was really important, and I found the conversations that we were having was how body image and, you know, my skin or my hair or whatever makes me feel less confident in the world and how I operate maybe in work or in relationships or, you know, we women have a strange burden. We let those things get in the way of everything else that we could be doing. 
So transformation from the outside in really was about if you can embrace this part of yourself and see yourself as beautiful and in a way in our society, beauty equals worthy. Beauty equals, you know, strength and confidence. So if you can get that out of the way, you can do anything. So it transforms everything inside. I had a client, her, um, I, I copied her email on my blog. It literally made me cry when I got it. She just tore herself apart, and she had attached a picture of herself. She was adorable. So when she walked in, I told her, you, you're dropping all of this at the door. This does not come in here, and it never goes out again. She said she smiled like a monkey. Um, her skin was terrible. She felt like she didn't have any femininity. So when we went through the process, you could see her just blossom. She bought every image I took of her, and I still receive emails from her. This changed my life. I have been able to do everything that I've wanted to do. I'm ready to date. I mean, her life is completely different. And that, to me, is the epitome of what I do. She's able to go out in the world. Just seeing herself in these images is able to change how she operates in the world. And I think that that's a ripple effect. You've reached the end of our free preview for this content. If you enjoyed what you've heard so far, then you're sure to get a lot out of the rest of this great program. To finish listening and ensure that you don't miss out on future information-packed programs like this, become a Xenolog Insider member today. You'll have access to all our interviews, members-only articles, e-books, and our special monthly live training webinars and Q&A calls. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to seeing you on the inside.